Support for the Capital Connection comes from United University Professions, representing 37,000 academic and professional employees at SUNY campuses and teaching hospitals across New York State. Frederick E. Cole, President, UUPinfo.org. And New York State United Teachers, representing professionals in education and healthcare, online at nysut.org. It's the Capital Connection. Hi, I'm Alan Chartok. Joining us this week is Republican New York State Assembly Minority Leader William Will Barclay. Leader Barclay, always great to talk to you. You're terrific to come on and converse with us. Good to see you back here. Thank you. The elections are coming quickly, Mr. Leader, and a new Quinnipiac University poll shows Democratic incumbent Kathy Hochul has a slight 50 to 46 percent edge. Four points on Republican challenger Lee Zeldin in the New York governor's race. Hochul leads in New York City by a large margin, but Zeldin has a slim majority in suburban communities. A poll from Siena College released a few hours earlier showed Hochul with an 11-point lead. So what do you make of these two polls? Well, I think, frankly, they're both good news for Lee Zeldin. Obviously, you want to be close in the polls. You'd like to be leading the polls. But New York is, a, as you're well aware of, a very blue Democratic state. And the fact that he's in striking distance, I think, um, illustrates that his campaign's working because he's focused on issues that New Yorkers care about. And that's, you know, crime. Uh, that's the economy. That's, you know, transparency. Uh, in Albany, ethics in Albany. So I think he is doing what he needs to do. He's staying on message, and I think it's, it's showing as he gets these polls continue to tighten in New York. Well, you know, it was a while ago, but it was something that George Pataki won three times a Republican. What does Zeldin have to do to replicate that? Well, I think he's got to continue to do what he's doing and not stay on message. Uh, obviously, the Democrats' interest is trying to knock him off message, uh, there's a lot of fear mongering going on, but I think people on the street know when you have particularly crime. I mean, I've been traveling the state um, as a result of you know my position as minority leader, and it doesn't make a difference where I am, whether it's in Long Island, whether it's in New York City, whether it's in the suburbs or upstate. People are concerned about some of these policies that have been passed in Albany that uh, you know, frankly, they relate to direct. Uh, line from A to B uh, that's causing increase in violent crime. So Zeldin and particularly his um, uh, his Lieutenant Governor Pick, Allison Esposito, who's a former, I think, uh, NYPD lieutenant, um, you know, can speak very clearly on that and their message is resonating. So, Will, do you think that the Democrats in general are in trouble here? Yes, I think there is reason they should be very concerned. And I'm not just saying that because of Lee Zeldin. I'm saying that because I can see it with our own candidates running across the state on a similar message. Now, ultimately, New York, as I said, is a very blue state, so it's hard to win, but it's not impossible. As you point out, George Pataki did it, and, you know, I'm optimistic it can be done this time. So I think there's reason to be concerned. Um, there's going to be, you know, a blowout for Lee? Probably not, but it's going to be close, and I hope he can get over the top on election night. So when you see a poll like this from Siena College, what do you make of it? How much of what polls are showing can we take to the bank? <laughs> well, that, that's a great question. As a candidate, I never rely on polls because I've been burned with them before and I always run like I, you know, running 
12 points, 20 points behind, and I would recommend that to anybody running for public office. That being said, they do show a bellwether of where things are going, and it's hard to predict where turnout's going to be. That usually what screws up poll numbers is turnout from one side to the other is stronger uh, one way or the other, and that can screw up numbers. But, uh, you know, when you see a group of polls that show, you know, particularly in the governor's race, tightening, I think that's something you shouldn't, you know, ignore, and I think it should be, you know, taken as a indicator of where things are. We're talking to Assembly Minority Leader William Barclay, the Republican, of course, is Minority Leader. So let me ask you this. How serious is crime in New York State? In other words, is that really what would put the Republicans over in an election cycle? I think so. I mean, we had a great time when we had declining crime over the last, you know, decade or so. But now you, and it, you know, the, the Democrats push back and say, well, it's not because of our policy. But they don't push back and say there isn't rising crime. I mean, the statistics prove that out. And I think that leads to people, particularly in the, I would say, in suburban areas in the city where Republicans traditionally have difficulty uh, winning. Uh, people want to be safe in their communities. And it doesn't take all these statistics to prove it. You just open the paper, look at the front page of mm. any paper, and you can see recidivists back, putting, getting put back out on the street. You see violent crime, you see shootings. And uh, that causes, rightfully so, causes concern. And if there are anything that people want their government to do is to keep their communities safe. And clearly the one-party rule in Albany is failing with that. So can Republicans do that better than Democrats keep people safe? I think without a doubt. You know, I've said on this show, I said before, let's take bail reform, for example. I don't think anyone was necessarily against doing some bail reform. But, of course, what happened with one-party rule is they take it to extremes. And I think there's a lot of things. For instance, giving judges discretion, I think, is a common-sense approach to bail reform if there's a dangerousness to the community by re-releasing the person. Uh, That makes sense to have the judge have that discretion. Other states have that. It appears to be working better in other states. So there's issues like that where, unfortunately— Democrats haven't reached out to Republicans, haven't listened to prosecutors, haven't listened to judges, and just have gone to the extreme on one side. And the result, you know, these policies aren't passed in a vacuum. There's real-world consequences for stuff that gets passed, and unfortunately, we're suffering from those real-world consequences right now. Well, Will Barclay, the question I then have is, can we assume people of color and Hispanics will get a lousy deal because they're in a minority position? Some people say that. Well, I would say just the opposite. Obviously, the highest crime rates are happening in a lot of minority uh, African-American neighborhoods. So if you can clean up crime, uh, I think, you know, it helps them uh, extremely well. And, you know, interestingly, some of the poll numbers, I haven't analyzed every poll, but I see the cross tabs on some of them. And Hispanics are strongly coming to Lee Zeldin. We got some work to do with African Americans, but I I think everybody wants safe communities. And where the crime's the highest, they're probably the ones that most acutely are aware of it and want change on that. So I'm optimistic that minority communities will be coming towards Lee. And it is bearing out. I'll tell you, again, it's bearing out with some of our candidates. We have races in the city that in the past we have never been competitive in, but uh, yeah, I'm optimistic that maybe we can pick up a seat or two in New York City. Well, you know, I have a very good friend who was walking down into a subway years ago and got conked on the head. He, no. he was hurt. And I'm telling you, he'll never forget it. And nor will people like me who talk to him about his experience. Right. Nobody wants to get conked on the head. Nobody wants to be, you know, hurt. And this is something that I think the Republicans have a responsibility to talk about. Absolutely. And, you know, you think of the bad old days, particularly in the city, uh, where you used to be able to couldn't really drive your car in the city. If you did, you had to just suffer the consequences of it got broken into or your radio getting yeah. stolen or whatever it was in your yeah. car. And I think people feel, at least those that remember who are around, feel that the city particularly is on edge and is heading back in that direction. That rightfully so causes a lot of angst. Let me ask you this. The Republicans have been pushing the issue of inflation. The economy is obviously a big, important point. Now, in state politics, how important is inflation? I think it's big. And I think, again, it's the overall mood of the electorate. Uh, For instance, uh, gas prices 
you know, particularly here upstate, are still, you know, really high, <laughs> expensive right. for families. So if you have to commute a ways, that takes a big chunk out of your budget. Uh, food prices, I think, again, we've talked about this, but food prices, I cannot go into the grocery store even for a few items without spending, you know, 50 or $60 uh, that used to go in to cost 12 or 13 You see across the board, um, you know, meat and uh, other um, food is, you know, skyrocketing. So that's putting a real dent on people's budget and then in people's budget. And then, you know, you just think of the general economy in New York, although we've had some good news, uh, particularly upstate, uh, there's always been this concern that we have, never been able to, because we're a high cost state, never be able to effectively compete against, you know, other states or the rest of the nation. As a result, we're losing population. So people look around and say, well, who's in power? Well, you have one party rule in Washington, you have one party rule in um, Albany, uh, and there's got to be some accountability. And so I, I, you know, what state government, we can't necessarily snap our fingers and change uh, inflation, but one thing we can do is stop, stop spending like drunken sailors, and that's certainly going to have a lead into improving the economy and probably have an effect on lowering inflation. And there's stuff we can do immediately in the state, which we advocated for is take off some of the sales tax uh, that we have for gasoline, which we end up doing, but we could go farther and do um, other products, home goods and stuff uh, that would also lower the cost and probably help ease the burden of inflation against New York families. Well, Will Barclay, talk to me a little bit about abortions. Among the people that I know, and, you know, my crowd is sort of center-left, abortion is um, a very important thing, the right for a woman to control her own body. But there seems to be some dissonance between Republicans and Democrats on this. You want to talk about it? I'd be happy to. First of all, I don't think anything that results in this election is going to change a woman's right to have an abortion in New York State. You know, it's just, again, because of a strong Democratic state, I bet if you pulled it, the pro-choice would probably outweigh pro-life pretty substantially. So nothing that's going to happen in this election is going to change that. It will always have the right. So I think Democrats that are bringing up that issue are really bringing it up just for political reasons, not really worried about it from a public policy yeah, and I think, you know, people are concerned about that, but is that the number one issue facing uh, New Yorkers at this time? No, because things aren't going to change probably as a result of this election uh, regarding abortion. Well, it is an issue. Uh, I think it's a potent issue for a lot of people. And I'm wondering whether the colleagues that you have are, you know, necessarily opposed to a woman's right to abortion. You talk to them. What are they saying? Well, well, yeah, I, I, you know, I think there's a uh, broad uh, band here of where people stand on abortion. You could say if you pulled uh, some of the pro-abortion uh, policies, for instance, you know, legalizing abort, abortion right up to the date of uh, birth, uh, I think that's very unpopular. So I think there are two extremes on there. I think most people fall somewhere in the middle, and it is an issue, but again, I don't think it's the primary issue that New Yorkers are concerned about right now, because ultimately, that policy that we have in New York that allows a woman to have an abortion is not going to change as a result of this election, regardless of how you vote. Talk to me a little bit, Will Barclay, about the Supreme Court decision on concealed carry. Doesn't this do more to hurt the issue of increased crime and gun violence? Well, that the Supreme about letting you know, presumably uh, giving people the easier ability to conceal carry. But legal gun ownership has never been an issue generally uh, regarding violent crime in New York State, I mean, or in the country for that matter. And I thought it was interesting that we could race down to Albany, uh, institute some really onerous policies that make it probably, you could argue, worse or more difficult to be able to get a concealed carry license than it was before the Supreme Court uh, decision. But we can't race down to Albany and try to pass some policies that will really address violent crime, like reforming the so-called cashless bail or bail reform or raising age or any other type of policy or providing more um, money for law enforcement, et cetera. So uh, it's interesting that that was the first reaction to that. Interesting how quickly the legislature can work in that regard, but how slowly we can work on uh, solutions that really will 
I think, solve some of the increased crime that we're seeing in New York. And those positions are? This is what I laid out. I mean, again, how about giving judges discretion for dangerousness for a criminal that mm-hmm. instead of releasing him automatically on bail reform? How about looking at the raise the age uh, law and perhaps not just letting anyone back on the street and allowing them to recidivize, which doesn't help them, by the way. It doesn't help the community. Uh, these people have no structure in their lives. So maybe some sort of institutionalization is appropriate for younger people. Uh, how about looking at just pay, uh, providing the resources for uh, law enforcement and make sure that they can be out on the street uh, defending and standing up for our communities. So there's three things that we could do. We could do it any time. It's just a matter of the political will to do it. And so, Will Barclay, do you carry a gun? I have my concealed carry. I don't carry a gun, but I got mine a long time ago because for the exact reasons that we're discussing now, I was always worried that they're going to take that right away. And if I ever did want to carry, I want to make sure I have the legal right to do so. I probably had a concealed carry license for well, 10 I, or 15 I, years. I'm even longer, but I don't carry no. Well, Will, I, I once told my wife on the advice of a man who's now passed who sold guns legally. And he said, you should have a gun. You're an unpopular figure. You should have a gun. So, so, <laughs> I don't imagine that's true. But. <laughs> so, I, so I came home and I told my wife, I want to get a gun. And she said, and do you also want to get a divorce? So there are people, this is a very contentious issue, this business about yeah. carrying guns in New York. Um, I take it your wife wouldn't like to see you carrying a gun into your home either, right? Yeah, it's funny. That I think that's maybe a gender split on there. And But interestingly, you know, with any kind of gun control legislation, or any kind of legislation for that matter, there is a level of education. My wife wasn't raised around guns. She really had no idea, you know, about hunting or for protection or whatever. She just had no experience with guns. And so during the, you know, for instance, all the claims about Cuomo's uh, salt ban, the SAFE Act, you know, that was where my wife was confused on exactly what that was outlawing. And everybody says, well, these assault weapons ought to be banned, but, you know, realize that they, you know, the equivalent of a hunting rifle, the, the, the performance of the gun is no different. It just looks a little bit scarier. Let's talk a little bit, if we can, about unions. A unionization vote by workers at Amazon's ALB facility in this right. Kodak has fallen short by a two-to-one margin. What do you think that means? Well, I hope it just means, I guess, that the employers felt that they're getting a better deal by not unionizing. Uh, We have a big plant uh, here up in in central New York that I think they're beginning to talk about uh, unionizing uh, there, and uh, we'll see where it goes. My understanding, I don't know this for sure, but my understanding is that some of the union organizers are coming out of New York City. They felt like they had, I think it was just Staten Island, where they actually were able to unionize the plant. So, again, I think it's up to the workers. The workers feel like um, uh, they can get a better circumstance by unionizing. Uh, God bless them. But at the same time, if they don't, uh, that's that's fine, too. Would you characterize yourself, Will Barclay, as a union man? I do. To some degree, and uh, I have very good relationships here in Oswego County because the trades and some of the um, we have a lot of nuclear facilities. We have three uh, nuclear reactors here, so there's been a long history of labor and strength of labor where I live. But it's been a relationship that's been beneficial to everyone, and I point to the fact that we're able to keep the Fitzpatrick nuclear plant open because we had a um, synergies and a alliance between management, uh, labor, uh, biz, local business, et cetera. So it was very, it was really very effective in being able to advocate for that plant and get keep that plant open. So I can see where it is very effective, and that's where I support it. I think I'm, I definitely support good paying jobs uh, for all of New Yorkers, and uh, labor certainly can help in that. I get concerned where they get off the rails uh, with labor, and I think sometimes it's not really the rank and file labor. I think it's sometimes the head of labor that gets very political and uh, maybe it's pushed policies that uh, uh, isn't necessarily what the rank and file want, and that's probably where I differ with labor from time to time. So what do you make of recent local efforts to unionize around the country in places like Starbucks and Amazon? Do you think that's healthy? Uh, I, I think it's an effort, an effort 
it's, I wouldn't say it's unhealthy. I think the employer should have the right to do it. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think also they should have the right not to unionize. And the fact, you know, that maybe at times their benefit from, they have to make sure that they understand the benefits of unionizing versus not unionizing. If, again, if the workers at Starbucks feel like um, this is, they're getting somehow oppressed and it's management that's oppressing them, and if they work together as a group, as a union, God bless them. I, I, I don't necessarily always see that with Starbucks. I just don't quite understand the, you know, how they could get a better deal out of management by unionizing, but I'm not inside that circumstance, so I can't speak really intelligently about it, but, you know, uh, so I don't know if it's healthy or not. It's certainly a right you have to try to unionize, and if they're successful, God bless them. Let's go, if we can, to Republican Party politics. If the party chairman, Nick Langworthy, wins the 23rd District Congressional race, who you got for his replacement? <laughs> He's going to be GOP state chairman, chair. you mean? Yeah. Who you got? Well, you know I don't like to get, I don't like to get bogged down in the party politics. Uh, well, I like it when so. you do. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure whoever uh, becomes chairman, they're going to be great because they'll have Lee Zeldin as governor, and we'll see the ascension of the Republican Party in New York State as a result. So, uh, I think everybody's just focused on getting to this election right now, and there's a few names out there. And I, I would say I think uh, all those people that I've heard uh, would be very good state chairman. Let's talk about the Environmental Bond Act. It's Proposition 1. The measure would allow the state to borrow up to $4.2 billion to improve and restore New York's natural resources and reduce climate change impacts. Should New Yorkers vote yes in November on the Environmental Bond Act? I'm not going to vote for it, and this is why. We are wait, 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 go for it. Men- you mean go for the question or go for the or vote for it? I'm not going to vote for it, right. Right. Uh, and this is what we are spending a tremendous amount on the environment in New York. And I really say I'm an environmentalist myself. I live in the country. Uh, I love to fish. I love to hunt. I love being outside. Uh, and I want clean water just as much as the next person. But when we get into the climate change, uh, it's really, I think we have to look at the cost benefit analysis of this. And it hasn't been done in New York. You know, New York is only responsible for something like 05 of all CO2 emissions, 0.5% of all of global CO2 emissions. So if all this money we're spending, even if we're 100% successful, which is probably unlikely, but even if we're 100% uh, successful, we're not going to have a big impact on global warming. And when it'd be one thing we're just spending, you know, 100,000 here, 100,000 there, a million here, there. We're talking billions and billions of dollars. And that has to be paid for some way. And usually it's paid for through taxes, or higher fees, et cetera. And New Yorkers, we just can't be on this course because we can't afford to have the cost of living in New York continue to rise ever upward, uh, or we're just going to keep losing our population, and then that just builds upon it, a, a death spiral. So um, I, I just think we have to reevaluate what we're spending our money on when it comes to environmental, you know, so-called environmental uh, things and climate change because it's very, very expensive. Some of the stuff is improving to work or even reducing our emissions and will not ultimately have a big impact on global warming, uh, man, you know, our, our, our contribution to global warming. So, uh, yeah, I would vote no on it. I wouldn't recommend anyone else voting no, uh, not because I don't love the environment. It's a lot of money, and the rewards for that money I don't think uh, bear out. Okay, so Mr. Leader, here's a question. Let's talk about whether we're getting our money's worth, and we only have a couple of minutes, but I always like to ask people who come on the show whether they think the educational efforts that New York is making and spending are producing the results we want. So that's the question. We, I think we can always do better. Uh, I think our funding of schools in New York is not an efficient way of doing it. Uh, I would like to see more resources driven towards low-wealth school districts uh, on a more equitable basis. Uh, I think we have great teachers in New York. I think we have great infrastructure. Uh, But can we do better? Uh, Without a doubt. Because we spend a lot of money on education. Uh, I think it's the second biggest budget item uh, we have. And I don't think the results are always exactly there. And I think generally it's a result of the allocation of resources. 
My producer always gets mad at me when I go too far into the program and don't give him enough time to make it all hang together. But I have one more question I want to ask you. Should former President Trump honor the subpoena from the January 6th committee and explain to the American people his side of the story? I think it's a very slippery slope subpoenaing a former president. Uh, So I I think there's real... um, presidential value on this if you if he does do that you may want to do it but i think good for the balance of power in the country uh it's probably not a wise thing to him for him to do Pulse, Put your side of no, what he wants to do he certainly has he certainly has a bully pulpit to talk about his side of the issue i i worry that some of this is you know theater uh but again i, I think there's real consequences by subpoenaing a former president and then for him to comply with that subpoena, I think would also create the real consequences of the balance of power in our country. We're out of time. Our guest has been New York State Republican Assembly Minority Leader William Barclay. William Barclay, thanks so much for being here and for joining us. Always love it when you're on the program. Thanks again. Thank you. Capital Connection is a production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio. For copies, call 1-800-323-9262 or visit us online anytime at WAMC.org or just schedule a podcast anywhere you get your podcast. Make sure to ask for program number 2242. And join us again next week at this same time for another political conversation. Thanks for listening.